All right, time to talk about one of my favorite analytics techniques, forecasting. And specifically, I want to show you how we can create forecast sheets using historical data in Excel. Now, recent versions of Excel, I believe starting with 2016 and Office 365, include a built-in forecast sheet tool that allows you to calculate forecasts based on a given set of historical values. So for instance, if we have basic data like this, monthly average temperatures, which in this case actually continue to extend through about six years worth of data, what we can do is select both of those columns, including the month or the date indicator, as well as the values, drill into the data tab and click on the forecast sheet tool right next to the what if analysis options. And when we do that, we'll see a basic preview of the default forecast that Excel has produced, as well as options to customize things like the forecast length, the confidence interval, any seasonality, and also customize how to handle things like missing or duplicate values. And once you've configured those settings as you'd like, Excel will produce a sheet that looks something like this. This is the actual forecast sheet. It's a new tab in your workbook, and it contains the seasonality chart, as well as a new table of data containing your existing historical values, as well as a set of calculated forecasted values. And I'm going to show you a couple examples of exactly what this looks like in Excel. Now, one quick note, sometimes you can use tools like trend lines for very simple forecast exercises, but keep in mind that those won't account for things like confidence or seasonality. So for more complex or custom cases, I definitely recommend using this forecast sheet option instead. So common use cases here, for one, predicting any future values such as interest rates or stock returns. And two, if you wanna calculate an expected range of future outcomes based on a given level of confidence, this forecast sheet and the formulas that it produces are very, very helpful for doing that. So with that, enough talk. Let's go into Excel and practice building our own forecasts. All right, so for those of you following along with me, head to your pro tip workbook. We're looking for the basic forecasting demo in our purple analytics tips section. Go ahead and link straight out. And here you'll see two different sets of data. We've got stock market data here in columns A through E. We're looking at Apple stock prices, the closing price and the volume by day. And we also have some monthly average temperatures from Barcelona, Spain, which span about six years worth of data. So two very, very different types of data sets that we're gonna to use to practice forecasting. So let's start with our stock market data here. And one thing I wanna show you is if we were to select column B and control click the values that we wanna forecast, which in this case will be the closing stock price. Now, if we go to our data sheet and choose forecast sheet next to what if analysis, you'll see this error message. It says, hey, we can't create a forecast because your timeline isn't evenly spaced. In other words, you've got inconsistent gaps between some of these points. And the reason that's the case is because the market is closed on holidays and weekends. So we have these gaps, you know, like March 2nd and 3rd, where we don't provide any data here. There's no closing price or volume. So what I've done is add a new column here, column C, that's just a series of sequential values or an index that basically just labels the days, day one, day two, day three, regardless of whether it's a weekend or a weekday or a holiday, whatever it might be. And now if we select column C and D and go back into our forecast sheet, now we're able to produce an actual forecast. So Excel will take its best guess at your settings, you know, your forecast start, your forecast end, your confidence interval, seasonality, et cetera. But if you wanna customize exactly how this is configured, go ahead and drill into the options in the lower left. And here we've got a bunch of additional options to choose from. And one option is to change how far out you wanna forecast. So maybe instead of 1,574 days, maybe we only need to forecast to 1,400 days, which kind of shrinks the forecast length a bit. Another option is to actually change when the forecast begins. So by default, this forecast is gonna begin on the last day that we have actual values. And the reason why Excel defaults to taking that approach is that allows it to kind of use all of these data points, all of these historical actuals to help generate the prediction. But what we can do is change this, you know, to something like a thousand days. 
and force Excel to start the forecast earlier. And basically it gives us a period of overlap where we can actually compare the forecasted values to the actuals. Now the downside, which you know, we're seeing the result of here, is that by doing that, by accelerating the forecast start, we're feeding less historical information to Excel and therefore potentially impacting the accuracy of the forecast itself. So maybe we kind of split the difference here and say, start at 1100 days, that looks pretty good. We still have a good chunk of overlap here, but that seems to be a slightly more realistic forecast. Now, the other items that we can customize here are the confidence interval, and that's basically creating these two bounds, the upper and lower bounds, and telling us that we can be 95% confident that the actual observed values in the future will fall within these bounds. So watch what happens when we increase the confidence to 99, you'll notice that the bounds get further apart, We're creating a wider window that could potentially contain our actual future values. And if we shrink this down to something like 50% confident, now we have a much narrower bound and a much more difficult target to hit. Therefore, we're less confident that the actual values will always fall within this range. So generally speaking, you're gonna to wanna to stick with something like 90 or 95, those are kind of standard. And from here, we can also you know, deal with seasonality. Um, by default, Excel will detect seasonality automatically. Um, in this case, if there were a certain number of days or a certain period where we see a pattern repeat over and over and over, we could set that pattern manually. And I'll show you exactly how we could do that for the weather data. And then when we create this sheet, we can also include some forecast stats. If you'd like, just check that box. And last but not least, we've got our timeline range in column C day index values live in column D and then we can choose if we had missing points we could interpolate or leave those as zero in this case we don't have any missing points and if we happen to have duplicates we could choose how to summarize or aggregate those duplicates in most cases average is an appropriate choice there so with that I'm confident I'm happy with our choices the way we've configured this let's go ahead and click create and what Excel does is insert a brand new sheet here it gives us a little pop-up to welcome us to our new sheet. And it says, great, we've created a table with a copy of our data, columns A and B, along with the forecasted values and our confidence bounds in columns C, D, and E. So got it, sounds good. Let's go ahead and drag this sheet to the right of our forecasting sheet and name it something like stock forecast. Check it out, it's included the chart for us just like we previewed included these forecast statistics here in this little mini table in columns G and H. I won't get into those right now. And then got our actual copies of our historical data points here in columns A and B. And if we scroll down or even more efficient, select an empty cell and use the control arrow down approach. Here we go. The last day of our observed values, or in this case, the first day that we determined that we want our forecast to start, now these new columns are being populated here as well. And they're actually being populated with forecast formulas that are feeding in inputs based on how we configured our settings in the dialog box. And same thing with our lower and upper confidence bounds. We're using conf int or confidence interval formulas here. So if we wanted to tweak any of these settings, we could either go back and create a brand new forecast from scratch using the dialog box, or we could go ahead and update individual inputs or arguments of these functions and have the table update dynamically. So a really helpful tool there. Let's scroll to the top. And one thing I want to show you here is that in this case, we can edit this chart just like any other. And let's say that we wanted to follow a simpler approach for forecasting these stock values and simply go to our chart tools, add a chart element and throw a linear trend line in place. So that created this blue dotted trend line, which as you can see, follows almost the exact forecast that Excel has created. So in this particular case, using a linear forecast as a very quick, simple first pass might be a valid approach. And in fact, it's gonna produce almost exactly the same values as our forecast here, but that's not always gonna work. And one case where it often falls short is a case where you have seasonality. 
So let's jump back to our basic forecasting sheet, select columns G and H this time, which is our monthly temperature data, go back into data, and let's see what happens here when we choose forecast sheet. So take a look at this, very, very different pattern here, and there's clearly seasonality that's happening over the course of those six years of actual values. So the difference between this example and the stock example is that A, we can't just slap a basic trend line option here to follow this forecast path because there is a seasonality trend happening because literally we're looking at seasons worth of data. Um, so Excel is saying, all right, we've detected seasonality automatically. And if you set it manually, we're basically saying every 12 points, which are months, we see the same pattern repeat, which makes sense. So in this case, I won't create a new sheet because it'll look just the same as the other one. But there you have it, two good examples of how to use Excel's forecast sheet to provide predicted or forecasted values using two very different types of data.